and only grow from there. So we know that there are risks as well as tremendous opportunities. And you know, for my career, I've really focused on trying to understand some of the deep-seated roots of these social determinants of health and really trying to understand the perspective and experiences of children who are exposed to chronic and cumulative and insidious levels of violence in their, um, in their homes, in their communities, um, and within their lives and within the policies that structure and shape their lives. And as we, um, across the field, look at the long shadow that early childhood adversities and toxic social experiences and compounded disadvantage um, cast on children as they grow and develop into adulthood. We don't have time to review now, but there are profound um, uh, consequences for their educational trajectories, their developmental trajectories, um, their health and chronic health outcomes and their morbidity and mortality. And when we think about adversities, we have to think with multiple lenses. It's not enough to look just at the individual child or their set of circumstances. We have to think about how adversities are transmitted across generations and the ways in which unhealed and un unresolved wounds, emotional wounds, can carry forward into next generations. We have to think about trauma that occurs not at the level of the individual alone, but that occurs to communities and communities over time and the insidious ways in which structures and social systems can enact violence on the lives of children and families. We have to think in a historical perspective as well about trauma that has been faced um, by communities across generations. So there are many dimensions that we can think about. And a lot of times when we start to talk about trauma and adversities a lot, we begin to lean in to this lens of understanding, but it can really reinforce a deficit model um, that is um, uh, can be disparaging and uh, limit the way in which we think about all of the possibilities and opportunities that that communities um, hold. So we know that adversities are prevalent. Um, we know that they go across sociodemographic groups. But like most epidemics, those at the social margins of society face a differential risk and are more vulnerable to the consequences. So social conditions and structural conditions absolutely compound to influence risk. And some of those social conditions include the way in which we view and consider communities, as David was already sharing with us. And so when we think about inequities um, and the challenge before us, we really have to think in a variety of different ways. And one of the practices we try to encourage is one of structural competency, really looking beyond just individual events on their own, but thinking and thinking beyond patterns and trends we see across communities and neighborhoods. Because we can only react to events and we can anticipate patterns and trends. But if we truly want to be transformative, if we truly want to effort towards social justice, we really have to get underneath at the underlying structures and the mental models and cultural norms and mindsets that are supporting the development and design of those structures. So in my work, I had to take the humble step of putting aside a lot of my academic training and beginning to reorient to focus and collaborate and work in a very different way than I had been trained. And a lot of the work we do locally in Vital Village is really all around how we work in equitable partnerships and authentic engagement with members of the community. And we really focus on building the capacity of the community, not of individuals or individual families, but how do we create environments where the opportunity structures are robust enough to prevent every child from falling through the cracks and to encourage a greater sense of collective responsibility. And we use our understanding of adversities to help align our work, but we don't really stop there. And I'm not going to go through this piece for the sake of time, but I'm happy to share more about our model in the future. But 
We know that those closest to the problem are often closest to the solution, but furthest from the resources and power. And in our effort to build community capacity, we took an orientation to identify and find solutions within neighborhoods rather than introducing external solutions. We used our trauma-informed framework. We began to curate and share and raise data. And we began to think about how do you improve slowly over time. And all of this, really, the bedrock was a service learning and leadership model that really engaged many members of the community in a variety of ways. And we've had the privilege of now beginning to expand this model to other states around the country and other coalitions. But I want to just pause for a moment and speak a bit about resilience. Often when we think about resilience, we're thinking about it in a very individualistic way, in terms of kind of a John Henry, kind of a folkloric way. We often don't think about resilience as a collective property. Um, and I think that's the real good news when we're thinking about trauma and adversities and we're thinking about transformative. What are ways we can tap into collective resilience and community resilience? What are the dimensions of resilience that you could actually grow and progress at a community level? The ability to withstand adversities, the ability to adapt to chronic and ongoing adversities, and the ability to recover. And what we've learned in our work is this means that any edge of the flock could become a leader. We can't only have a sole model of leadership, or hierarchical model of leadership. We have to engender leadership among every member of the network. The second thing we've learned is to truly understand what it means to be marginalized and that marginalized is not only being marginal, that there are strengths that we often take for granted within the margins. So when we start to pay attention to the margins and actually design for and in partnership with those who are marginalized, we actually can strengthen our capacities of the community because those who have been marginalized actually have figured out so many creative, positive working solutions already. The second thing we've learned is around stories and narrative. It is absolutely fundamental to begin to identify and point out stock stories, to uplift concealed stories, to try to generate resistance stories, but also to think about some of the limitations of those three groups and to think about counter narratives. And this is how we came to work with Aisha. In this work, we are truly thinking not just about equity, but we're thinking about dignity. How do you value, reflect, protect, and uphold the dignity of each individual? And narrative and storytelling is a universal method to really uphold and uplift dignity. So we talk about equity, we throw that word around whole lot. What if we replace that word with dignity? And that's what we were able to do in collaboration with Aisha, and she'll share more about that. But this led us into a series of very courageous, very different conversations that upheld counter-narratives. And so now I'll introduce Aisha. Hi, everybody. That this is so strange to be like, you know, a person that people are waiting to hear. Um, <laughs> um, so yes, good afternoon. Um, I just, before I want to get started, um, I want to thank David, first of all, for holding space for this conversation. Um, it, you've been a really supportive mentor this past two years. And it's a really, it's a big honor to be able to visit a space outside of public health to discuss work that's at the intersection of justice and public health. Um, so I'm, I'm really honored to be here. Um, and I also want to say that it is intimidating and quite a trip to follow um, Dr. Point and Jarrett. Um, I, I met uh, Dr. Point and Jarrett uh, in my, literally my first week of the program um, at the School of Public Health and adopted her as my mentor. And um, thankfully, she's, she's been a, a great mentor and advisor and teacher um, and now collaborator. And I'm, I'm just truly, truly grateful for, for, um, for everything. So thank you. Um, so I want to get started by first, let's see. Um, it's not progressing. OK. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about my background. 
some assumptions that I have, and then share two real-world examples of how I've used storytelling and narratives in my most recent work um, with, a, with a strong emphasis on my dissertation work. So full disclosure here is that, that I am a student, <laughs> like many of you who, who are in this room, which means that I'm still learning. The, the, the point, um, my hope here is to hold space um, for conversations, for peer exchanges, so that we can have sort of a dialogue and an exchange that's that's equal. I think that everyone in this audience may have ideas and um, and um, their own sort of experiences with narrative, and I, I'd love to hear those today. Um, before I get into stuff, I really want to ask a, a first a, a question: um, How many of you actually use storytelling, qualitative methods, or any sort of narrative work in your own work? Okay, great, a lot of you. Um, and then how many of you actually focus those works on, um, on health? Okay, quite a few. And what about just on justice? Great, and something right at the intersection. Yeah, me too. Okay, great, so we're with, we're with peers. Um, so my whole career has really been dedicated to performing and documenting and measuring um, human stories. Um, and I, I want to really be clear, though, that this today's presentation won't be like an overview of all storytelling strategies that um, intersect with, with uh, justice. Um, instead, it's really just going to be a sample of, of some of the work that I've done. Um, so let's start a little bit with my background. Um, did anybody see the Beyonce Homecoming documentary on Netflix this weekend? <laughs> By round of applause. Boop, boop. Okay, if you haven't, I highly, highly recommend it. Um, so it was fabulous for lots of reasons, but for, for our purposes, I'd like to think about two aspects. Um, one is the way that she intertwined a commitment to social justice and cultural production within this popular form of, of um, cultural um, uh, entertainment, right? Um, and I also want us to think about the response of the crowd. Um, who willingly repeated the words that she said on stage and mimicked her outfits, mimicked her, her choice of, of, um, of movements. And it got me to thinking about a question that was raised in me when I was younger, which is how might we measure the community health impact of that, right? when we see cultural representations of us that are strong and empowered, how might that motivate us to actually measure that as a storytelling event? as an event that is an event of artistic expression, right? We could you know, look at how many shares it gets, how many likes it gets on media, um, but how might we actually embed scientific tools, validated measures of, of community health or, or um, resilience into something like that? And that really motivated, questions like that have motivated my work. Um, so I, I grew up, as David said, as a performing artist. Um, I created songs and scripts for professional um, theater companies um, since I was 13. I studied journalism in undergrad and, and did that work in the health and education sectors for, for, quite a, for quite a while domestically and abroad. And then I've worked in public health for the past 10 years, managing health programs domestically and abroad and leading por portfolios of mixed methods research with a strong emphasis on community-based participatory research, right? Which Dr. Boynton Jarrett really laid out for us, that sort of equitable, sort of um, partnership-based, community-based research. So with that background, I, I come to this work with carrying a couple of assumptions that I want to just orient people to. One, as Brene Brown says, stories are data with souls, and their exploration and measurement are deserving as just as much trust and clout as qualitative research methods, as quantitative research methods, forgive me. Two, stories in the expressive arts actually heal us on both individual and community levels. There's tons of data to back this up. I'm not gonna share it now, but they promote restoration and population health, both physical and mental. And number three, stories can shift the way that we um, uh, actually orient, uh, come to political change. So Jeff Chang, who's a, a hip hop author, um, um, author and historian, has said that cultural sh shifts actually precede po political shifts. So impacting the stories and the narratives and the discourses we use as a society can actually bring about social justice change and political change. Those are the assumptions that really ground this work. And so, in most of my research, I focus on the way that stories and expressive arts can promote healing among marginalized and disenfranchised groups. 
and I worked in academic and private foundation settings using a slew of research methods that are, that are listed here to explore a range of health issues and their intersection with stigma and discrimination and prejudice experiences. We don't have time to go through all of these, so today I'm gonna focus on two storytelling strategies, digital narrative storytelling and narrative-based perspective taking, both of which require expressive writing. So to start with digital video narratives, I'm really intrigued by the possibilities in techno that technology affords marginalized and disenfranchised groups um, for documenting their own stories. And in 2017, 2016, I was selected um, um, as an emerging leadership fellow at the Vital Village Network and invited to facilitate a digital storytelling workshop with fathers of color from Boston who had prior experiences with substance use and incarceration. And we ended up meeting for um, two days, having a workshop where they discussed the meaning of fatherhood. And um, they shared the examples of things that they had been to, through in their own lives. Um, this is just sort of a summary of how we went about this process. What I want you to take away from, from this slide is that these fathers um, led this, this, this initiative. Um, they were able to write their own scripts and create their own narratives. I helped them figure out how to like actually, you know, uh, create videos on, on um, using some software, but they ended up creating three to five minute videos that told a story about their experiences with fatherhood. So when we think about Dr. Boynton Jarrett's introduction about resilience, right, and about the way that we come to um, have collective resilience and collective experiences um, that sort of strengthen us. I want you to think about what you're about to see, which is a, a kind of a, a, a merged um, video that I created based on, on their story. So these are some of the fathers that were in that video, and now we're just gonna take a quick look um, at that, at that um, video. I will warn you um, that there is strong language and um, throughout this video for those of you who just take care of yourselves if you need to leave the room. I want them to know the truth. Truly, I love them. They gave him to me first. I cradled them in my arms. Everything became so surreal. Being a child myself, I had no concept of fatherhood. Having two children in the home by my 18th birthday was difficult at best. I remember the day I brought her home. I thought I was going to go crazy because she was a girl. And I thought about all the bad things I'd done to girls to play the game. She had two little pigtails. I thought she was mad cute. She had a list. And she used to say, Daddy, Daddy, I love you. I felt like I would not let my kids out. I love them so much because they just run up and hold me. They hold me. I just got off of work on Friday. And I do I am. I'm dirty. I'm sweaty. I knocked on the door. They ran right up to me. Like, Daddy. Yeah. Like a Hollywood movie, you know? I said, I'm just getting off of work, I'm dirty. They didn't care. They just kept holding me and holding me and holding me. He kept asking me, Dad, do you remember that one-handed catch I made on the sidelines? Dad, do you remember how I scored the touchdown? Dad, do you remember this, remember that? It occurred to me that my only son was seeking my approval. I feel like they hear these lies. She says, I don't love them. That I don't care about them. That I'm a piece of, you know what? That I'm in jail instead of in school. The worst you could think of. Some of it's true. They said I was a different person when I was using. And that I was gonna be either in jail or dead. My wife didn't wanna be with me because I was a drunk and I lost privileges to being around her and my son. He said, we're following into the stereotypical black American. You have never committed to anything. You should be running around with a lot of girls, man. Uh, I was sitting there drinking, getting high. 
I started staring at the wall and I felt my soul leave my body. And then when I turned around, I seen a shot. It was pointing right at my head. I looked at the shooter and it was me. I was holding the shotgun. I couldn't believe that. I couldn't stop remembering losing my mind. The hardest part was I had to go identify her anymore after the autopsy. That was a rough year. I went to eight funerals back to back. It was crazy. I was always isolating myself from everybody. I was buying big ass bottles and killing anything that would do the job. Anything to forget. And I just looked at my life, and the only person who could make it worse was myself. Um, and I started thinking about where I live, where I'm living. And uh, I tell you, I realized then uh, that the current lifestyle that I was living, uh, it ran its course. You know, change must come, or that death would be my outcome. It's funny, after accepting that fact, Sharp pains came running through and racing through my eyes. And I couldn't see for about 10 to 15 minutes. And during that time that I just spent with myself, I made that conscious decision to change. And honestly, I think that that was really the first time that uh, change began. So I'm going to stop it there just for the sake of time. Um, but. Um, I, my hope is that you'll uh, kind of reflect on, on um, some of the themes that you heard um, in those stories and how they relate to um, some of the themes that Dr. Boynton Jarrett raised um, at the beginning. Um, so that, that project really taught me a valuable lesson about how creating a space for expressive writing and deep listening promoted um, vulnerability and social support and empowerment. Much of that was aided by the fact that these fathers knew each other before, right? They were in this group called Fathers Uplift, um, which is a member of the, the network. Um, but I wondered if we could use a structure to induce vulnerability between people who don't know each other, perhaps between two groups that are at odds. And the groups that came to my mind um, in particular were police and urban youth of color. Um, I spent time at, in Baltimore at Johns Hopkins University and was there. Um, during the Freddie Gray riots, in fact, two blocks away from where the riots jumped off, and um, saw a lot um, in the way that um, stories were sort of neglected, especially stories of, of urban youth in the area. And it's hard, a lot of things not being sort of communicated. Um, and that really inspired this dissertation work, which is a me mixed method study, thinking about how we can take perspective taking, storytelling to impact trust and empathy sentiments between um, police and urban youth. And so this work recognizes the fact that distrust between police and urban youth is actually a psychological process, right? It's a psychosocial process um, that negatively impacts police effectiveness as well as mental health impacts among police um, and, and youth. Um, but it's the convergence of their individual sort of stress experience um, that creates social, physical, and mental health challenges that I believe warrant action and that is widely recognized as warrant, warranting action. And so there's a lot of programs that have been developed to intervene on this, this phenomenon of distrust between police and urban youth of color, one of which is called police youth dialogue programs. Has anybody heard of those? OK, OK, so police youth dialogue programs um, uh, are all over the country in major municipalities, including here in Boston. And, um, but a lot of them were really poorly measured, and, and few of them actually used pro-social methods. As, as Dr. Boynton Jarrett pointed out, a lot of them were focused on deficit, right? And not, a lot, not a lot of them were focused on sort of how do we build psychological strength? How do we build um, resilience in both groups? There was also sort of a one-sidedness to these interventions. They were focused on how young people um, felt toward police and not necessarily how police treated or felt toward their young people in the community that they served. And so I wondered, you know, how can we actually build a better police youth dialogue program? One that um, uh, addresses the social conditions that support trust, that build interpersonal empathy, counter social prejudice, while assessing the impact of it over time 
And so the pro program that I developed was called the Trade Project, and it aimed to do all of those, those things. So to, to assess the impact of these differences in, in police youth dialogue program quality, um, over time, I constructed a multi-site pre-post-post randomized control trial to test a standardized um, police youth dialogue program against an enhanced version, a version that was grounded in restorative justice and storytelling. So foundational to this is I was community engagement. And um, you know, this is standard. I'm, I'm assuming that most people are here from, are familiar with research, um, research methods and randomized control trials. Randomization occurred after participants were enrolled. And then um, they, they took a survey. They attended at one 90-minute workshop. They took another survey. And then I left them alone for four weeks, followed up with a final um, survey. So that's three surveys over a four-week period and, and just one workshop that they were exposed to. Um, so the, um, I had three steps of community-engaged research that was um, sort of foundational to this. And I wanted to put this in here because I didn't do this work by myself. I wasn't coming in, bringing my own ideas. This was co-created with community partners, including sheriff's office deputies and, and, and urban youth who were in the area. Um, and so just for the control itself, consisted of about four to 10 participants, about 90 minutes. We watched a, a partial film, partial part of a film on PBS called The Talk, Race in America, and then we had a 20 minute group discussion. So the, the point of this was really simulate police, traditional police youth dialogue session. There was no intervention, it was just about people um, sort of talking and seeing what happens through that conversation. The treatment condition, however, was 90 minutes, again, the same number of folks, but we used restorative circles, theater games and icebreakers, 15-minute expressive writing exercises, a 15-minute paired perspective-taking exercise, and then a 20-minute group discussion. So the aim here was really to disrupt the power differences and foster vulnerability and empathy between both groups. So um, just to take a deeper dive, I'm sure everyone here knows sort of the benefits of restorative circle for like inducing um, equity. Um, but then there was also a, a writing exercise where I asked everybody in the room to tell us a story about a time in your life when you felt misunderstood. I gave police and, and youth in the room 15 minutes by themselves to, to write on this topic. And then they had to follow this structured trade process. Um, it's a perspective taking process whereby I matched them, one officer, one young person, and they had to actually trade stories whereby the officer said aloud the story of the young person as if it happened to him, and the young person did the same as if it happened to, to her or him. So um, there's a lot of benefits, health benefits to each of these methods. All of them sort of increase empathy, um, and, and we could go into sort of the, the, the methods here, but these are grounded in evidence base about why I chose these specific um, activities. And what we ended up finding, we did this in Alameda County, California. It was an unincorporated area with um, lots of high crime, majority Latino area, um, and the unique thing about this area is that it had um, a sheriff's office that had been kind of working on trust building efforts since 2004 um, and had public health alignment and grounded their, their work in, in, in theory, um, the intergroup contact theory specifically. Really unique um, um, sheriff's office that actually hired um, an abolitionist to, to organize um, its operations. So 13 to 18, um, eight, young people were 13 to 18 years old, and they received $50 for their participation. Officers were actually given permission to attend on duty. Um, and just so you know, 100% um, of key leaders and stakeholders in the areas were on board with us doing this intervention. I actually asked all of them. So despite the systems change stuff that needs to happen when it comes to policing, is this kind of human-centered work even necessary? I know there's a lot of debate out there about whether you know, interpersonal level stuff is even helpful um, for, for something like this, and all of them endorsed and said yes, but they also warned me that these efforts are really necessary, but they're not sufficient. Um, I don't think it shifts the systemic reality of policing in this country, and that's something that I carried with me throughout this work. So I wanna get to exactly what we found. And what we learned was that when it comes to empathy, um, there's actually no difference between um, the control and treatment group. But when it came to trust, we saw a market difference in the treatment group. Um, when it came to institutional trust, it actually went up um, at each time point. And when it came to satisfaction, the, the amount that the group was actually satisfied with policing efforts in the area, um, it increased in both, um, both time points for the treatment group and decreased for both time points for the, for the control group. 
We think about a concept like social prejudice. We see that the treatment group, again, increased at each time point when it came to sympathy and admiration for each other just after 90 minutes of exposure to writing and storytelling. And that was a statistically significant finding. We also found some discourses that emerged. I did a, an in-depth discourse analysis, qualitative discourse analysis of the, the things that they wrote, the things that they said in their, in their workshops. And what we found was that the control group workshops actually simu um, replicated the power imbalances, the top-down hierarchical power imbalances that typify police youth interactions. Whereas in the, in the treatment group, we saw more equitable exchanges on a more peer-to-peer -peer level. And what that manifested as is that in the control group, officers spoke about four times more than kids in that group, versus in the treatment group, it was about 1.8 times more, with kids speaking twice as much in the treatment condition than they did in the control condition. And then we also look at the type of workshop interactions that they had. Again, this is all qualitative data. They, we can see that the control, the treatment group indicated in green here was, was endorsing things like praising each other, learning lessons from each other, finding common ground, expressing gratitude, and seeking information for each other. Where, whereas the control group was really thinking about teaching compliance to young people. That was actually the major takeaway from that group. Another indicator of power differential is exactly what was the, the cop saying. So we see on the control um, group side, an officer said, you know, everything we're saying here, it all goes back to compliance. If you comply, there will be greater trust between us. Whereas as the, the treatment group, he's focusing here on the similarities. There are situ situations here are very similar. The circumstances, even though they're different, they still come back together and relate to each other in a different kind of way. They really, a lot of um, people in, in, uh, found that they were feeling seen and heard in this group, mostly in the treatment group. They praised the study structure and many first time stories were shared. So I'm just gonna skip ahead um, to some of the implications of this work. Um, obviously we had a limited sample size. We have about 78 people in this sample. Um, but what we see is that um, there was a successful community um, collaboration and a responsive study design. And mixed me method study approaches really allowed us to see um, results that we weren't able to convey through the quantitative methods. Um, and I'm, I'm actually just gonna let our conversation structure the rest of our discussion. Um, Dr. Boynton Jarrett, would you like to just go ahead and talk maybe? <laughs> would that be better? <laughs> I feel like I have way more slides. Okay, so let's just talk. Okay, so we know you all have some incredible questions as well, which we want to get to, but maybe just to warm up, we'll warm up with a question or two. But Aisha, I mean, this is incredible work. It's incredibly unique. And you've also followed such a process of being really systematic about trying to capture this. Can you tell us a little bit about what might have surprised you as you were going through this work or what was a bit unexpected? Um, how did you come to identify that? Sure, I think the most unexpected um, aspect was sort of the openness of the officers that I worked with. Um, I, I come from, you know, my, my mother was a Black Panther. Um, I come from a, a, a skeptical um, sort of family and disposition when it comes to um, working with authority in general and then also working with officers. And I was really surprised that um, the officers gave me office space. Um, they, uh, uh, the, ch the captains on the unit actually mandated that their officers participate in this um, intervention. Um, that, so that was a, a really big surprise. The second surprise is really about the empathy findings. A lot of perspective taking work that we see actually shows that empathy increases um, at the second, like immediately following the intervention. And our intervention didn't find that. Um, and so that was a little bit surprising, maybe an indicator that the control group um, uh, condition was a little bit too strong. Perhaps the, the, the film that they saw was induced feelings and induced um, um, just a, the right amount of empathy, um, the same amount of empathy that they uh, perceived in, in the treatment group. So those are the two major surprises. Mm -hmm. And as folks are getting kind of their questions ready, I wondered another question. You know, um, academic institutions don't always do the best job with kind of supporting or encouraging participatory mm -hmm. research. You took a lot of community-based participatory steps in this work. What kind of message do you have for academic institutions on how they can actually create more pathways um, for scholars in this work? And what were some of the things that 
really enabled this for you that maybe the institution was also fully encouraging? Yeah, um, I, it, this was really hard work. And in, in the School of Public Health, we um, traditionally are told to do secondary data analysis, encouraged to do secondary data analysis for our dissertations. And so to collect your own data, one, is, is, um, is not encouraged. Um, but uh, two, um, to, to do it in a way that um, you have to depend on community partners was, was definitely discouraged in, in, my, um, in my case. So I think one would just be um, uh, practically supporting students who are interested in community-based participatory research, and also giving professors um, who may not be familiar with that um, sort of orientation a little bit more training and guidance on how to, to support students who want to do that. I think the second area would be around um, funding. Um, so traditional funding structures, I, I apply to all of them. Um, and you know, I come from a background of research. I know how to write grants. I know how to, to win grants. Um, and this was really hard fun to fund. Um, I ended up, you know, thankfully there was a, a couple of public service fellowships that opened up right around the time that I needed it. Um, and you know, that helped. <laughs> um, but if there could be more institutional funding for community-based participatory research at the pre-doctoral level. I think that that would be really, really helpful. Um, and not just one-off sort of $2,000 fellowships here or there, but like really supportive things. Because this work is not only helpful for hypothesis generation, this work is also helpful for hypothesis confirmation and for really building the quantitative tools that we need to keep moving this type of empathy and trust and psychosocial work forward. May I open it up to the author, uh, Elaine's Janet, you've got a question? Yes, yes. Awesome. thank you so much. I, I sure hope the School of Public Health is <laughs> I sure hope the School of Public Health has a good sense to hire you as faculty. <laughs> um, yeah, let's write that a was really about wonderful. that. Um, my question is, uh, this is impressive work. How do you take it to scale as an yeah. intervention? I appreciate that question. Um, and it was a question that I um, actually was posed before I even started the work. The sheriff's office said, why do we need to do this? Um, because they actually been doing trust building work. We have the answers. We don't need individual or interpersonal work. We have the answers. Um, and they said, if we're going to do it, we want to know that it can be a structure that we can use. And so after they saw these, I went and presented these findings to them in January. And they were actually really interested. Their first question to me was, OK, now how do we embed it? What do we do? Right? And so a lot, of, a lot of the police youth dialogue programs that we see are, are well-intentioned. They're, they're wonderful. We have so many great anecdotes from it. But the structure was one. Um, and if I might, I just pull up this one quote from an officer who really says it much better than I could ever say it. Um, and he says that, you know, OK, so cops are going call to call, and kids are in their own world, and the community is in, in its own world. The only time where they intersect is on the worst day of somebody's life. So I think that if it's tough to grow organically, but if something like this is blended into the fabric of the job and in the community culture, then yeah, it can be beneficial. And we actually had a lot of officers endorse that, that they wanted to make these connections, but they didn't know how. They didn't have a structure. They weren't incentivized to actually make these types of human connections. And so I think that the, the structure itself, I think, um, as long as a, a sheriff's office is on board, <laughs> um, and it, it seemed to be, so yeah. There's so many ways to make an impact, and I'm so inspired by all the levels at which you've um, really done deep work. And I'm curious, really honestly, what is the role of research? Why not, you know, like yeah. as, a, as a person who's kind of split across a few different community research, um, I'm curious about your thoughts about that, you know, for this specific uh, project, but also if you have other, if other things come to mind. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would love to hear your take on this too, Dr. Point Jared. <laughs> um, but I, I think my initial response would be, um, when I arrived, and I'll just use this as an example, but I've heard this more and more um, a lot. 
which is that we know what we're doing. We hear from the community anecdotally that this is working. In fact, when I arrived there, the sheriff's office really didn't think they had any problems. Um, they were like, the community loves what we're doing. The, you know, we have mothers and fathers, and you know, they, they come to our classes. There's this, there's that. It's great. But when I actually did the formative research before ever going into the field and doing the work, they had a big issue with a lot of people that they weren't reaching, right? So there's a need for not only um, sort of this attitude and behavior surveys that we can do before we will ever go into the field, but we need to validate that this stuff is actually working and for what and for whom, right? For what outcomes and, and for what groups? What groups is it missing, right? Um, I don't think that research should ever sort of um, circumvent or, or overpower or even take funds from the community work that is actually sort of, you know, feeding people or clothing people. But I think, do think that there's room for um, uh, things to happen in concert and in parallel so that we know and we can learn from our strategies and not repeat old mistakes. Mm -hmm. I, don't know. I would connect to that only just to say, um, you know, I think one thing that research can drive us to do is, con is to be unsatisfied with what we know mm -hmm. and to be constantly inquisitive, but also then have a systematic process to explore mm -hmm. that and then a process to to critique mm -hmm. how we've explored it. So I guess I see research as a tool for, for discourse and for conversation. And what's so exciting to me about the work that Aisha does is but the more you can take something like narrative into a space where data could be told as a story mm -hmm. or your story could be recognized as an advocacy tool, but beyond that, the more we can introduce more voices into research, because the one problem we have with research is it's very um, hierarchical in terms of who the, the voices are that uh, can contribute to research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Alicia, you have to talk about it. Okay. Please go on. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just hold it. I just want to say thank you for your presentations. I really enjoyed being here today. And I just wanted to ask, so you're studying in Baltimore, and I'm just curious, what are the barriers to conducting this kind of research in Baltimore and or in Boston? Yeah, so um, so this work actually took place in, in Alameda County, California, um, but I was inspired by some of the work that I had done in Baltimore as well. Um, the barriers were real. Um, I actually tried to do this work in Boston before I ever went to, to California and um, was told, uh, okay, so I'll be um, diplomatic. <laughs> um, um, I think just as um, institutions are hesitant to engage with journalists and, and sort of, um, and uh, people who may have a negative outside view um, of their work or portray it negatively to the, to the media, right? Um, I think sheriff's office and police departments that I tried to engage with to do this work were equally, equally as hesitant to work with researchers who may skew um, and sort of um, uh, uh, mischaracterize the work that they were doing um, to benefit their research aims or do it in a way that wasn't transparent. And so I think that one of the major barriers is distrust between um, traditional you know, policing institutions and the research community, but also I think a second barrier is the way that we have traditionally done research, which has been extractive, right? We go in and we talk to, to, to institutions and communities, and we take it away, and we go and we don't talk to them again, you know, or we tell them exactly the way it needs to be in order for them to get this, these grant funds, and we don't actually um, let them help us, right? And so I think the community-based participatory research um, sort of approach and strategy lends itself to more equitable and um, partnership um, uh, approaches to, to doing this type of work. Um, the other barrier is just time. Um, you know, I needed to finish this stuff. Like, if I could really have done this, I would have wanted to intervene on the system level and, you know, intervene on every single level of the, the, the nested systems model. Um, and we weren't able to do that because of time. So, um, yeah. So could I ask a quick question before I hand it off? And it's about the sample and, and, and you know, because we have some issues about RCTs generally, you know, in my shop, so I'm kind of curious uh, how you selected your sample. Sure. Um, so there was a, uh, we used respondent-driven sampling um, 
heavily respondent-driven sampling. For the officers, I went and, and conducted uh, presentations at muster, so that's morning meetings that they have every day um, to try to get people on board. I was there twice a week to recruit directly from officers. Um, and then I also, I went to, I think, like 10 different um, businesses. I had, um, uh, partnership agreements with the school district. I had partnership agreements with local community organizations. I mean, I tried my best to get as, as a wide of a swath um, of, of parent and community and young person interests. Um, and so there was a, a number of different ways of sampling. And in the end, um, there were a lot of things and a lot of factors that um, impacted on who chose to be in this study. Um, most people volunteered. Some people were encouraged strongly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Aisha. This was fantastic. Question. Um, I can't remember if you said the program or the implementation was built in collaboration with an abolitionist, but how do you get those two fundamentally different people um, to work together? And for those who are um, unfamiliar with what I'm saying, abolitionists fundamentally um, want to see a world without police in prisons, mm -hmm. and so to have police officers <laughs> work with people who don't want their jobs to exist. Curious how that played out. Yeah, for sure. Um, and doing this work in um, Alameda County, Southern Alameda County, uh, just so you have an orientation, it's 10 miles south of Oakland. And Oakland is probably one of the strongest, stro uh, it is a stronghold of abolitionist sentiment. Um, and so there were, um, I noticed that young people in the study were receiving messages and, and hearing abolitionist messaging um, very strongly in endorsing that. Um, and it was a big uh, barrier for them to even want to engage in this work. Um, at the same time, though, I wanted to make sure that I was checking myself, because I, at heart, believe that we can do better than traditional policing um, systems in this country. And so not only was um, were there abolitionists that I um, worked with and consulted with to make sure that my methods were safe for young people and make sure that restorative circles were grounded in, in principles that wouldn't harm young people, especially in the control group. Um, but my coder for all of my qualitative research identifies as, as an abolitionist. So she was reading my work and she's a co-author on two of my papers to make sure that my work was not slanted in any way by reformist sentiment. Um, additionally, there were a lot of people who were stakeholders um, and including the director of operations for the Alameda County Sheriff's um, Office nonprofit who identified as, as abolitionists. And the only reason why they participated in this work was because they actually believed that this office wanted change, wanted system change. They, they, that's the only reason that they worked there. And it was the only reason that I wanted to work for that department or you know, wanted to partner with that department because this work can't exist if it's not going towards systems change. Um, it, there would be no point in making people feel better um, in con concurrent conditions if it's not going to progress beyond current conditions. So that was an agreement that I had in the beginning. Hi, um, <laughs> so thank you again. So I have like a twofold question first. Uh, what were the responses from the younger um, students and then uh, the officers when you presented your findings to them? And then um, second, what would be like the next model for systems change, right? Given that there is this resistance from um, it looks like Alameda is like an outlier, right? <laughs> what is, is it, you know, circulating this type of finding to across the nation? What, what do you envision would be those next steps? Um, so the, the response from um, the community members that I was able to reach in January, there will be a, another rollout of, of, of the, the results um, in June, um, was, was interesting. Um, the kids definitely agreed with the, the, the attitudinal surveys that I, that I got at the beginning. Um, and they were, were skeptical and cautious about the results and findings and the strength of sort of, um, of storytelling as a method. Um, in their minds, they knew somebody or you know, had had their own experiences that were negative with the police department and were very skeptical. They were like, well, this isn't gonna change anything. Versus like the kids that actually participated in the program, they were like, oh yeah, I'll buy that. You know, that, that, was, that worked, right? Um, so there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. I do not think that this is something that could be, you know, scaled up and systematized quite yet. I think that it needs further study and larger samples. Um, secondly, this is a cultural 
culturally unique place um, and it's community specific, right? So what happened here may not happen again in this community at a different time. There were a lot of factors that probably led to this, the results looking this way at that time. Um, a lot of external events that were happening on the ground. Um, so this may look different even in this place right now, right? And I don't think that even the communities um, in Chicago or in Baltimore will be receptive to the way that this looked um, uh, for, for their needs. It may not meet their needs, right? So another researcher is gonna have to go in and do the formative research and make sure that the, the, these type of methods and activities will work. And if not, here's the way that we need to shape it, right? That's the, that's the nature of community-based participatory research, that we can adapt to the community's needs. Um, and so that's what I would think is, is constant iteration. I just had a quick question, maybe a simple one, maybe a hard one. Um, have you thought of different means and methods to just directly connect your research and the work you're doing with the individuals and the households that could be directly benefiting from the work rather than uh, continuing the, the kind of like mystical layer of elite institutions that I think a lot of kids uh, in low income households are intimidated by. And like if they could just come here and listen to your presentation and understand it, that would be fantastic yeah. and then go home. But like rather than, I guess, um, like are there, are there additional ways to kind of reconceptualize what it means to engage community? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, and I'm working with, um, I, so there was, this is a much longer presentation for my, my defense. Um, but in that, um, I, I, I formed a community advisory board um, that is still advising me on the best methods to share these findings with the community. Um, and one of their ideas is actually to, to create a workbook um, so that students and officers um, are not just looking at these data passively and saying this is truth, but looking at the data and saying, okay, now what will we do with these as a reality, right? There's a lot of mental health data that I have on this, a lot of data on psychosocial stress, a lot of data on poverty and maternal um, education, and just a lot of stuff in there that would be informative, um, not only to people in the, the officer setting, but to social service providers in this area, to people that all of the whole community, right, needs to know these data. And I tell them all the time, and I told my committee, um, these are not my data, these are their data. And so it is, it is up to them in collaboration with me to, to figure out how they want to use them and how they see fit um, in terms of, of, of dreaming up and envisioning a practical utilization for them. Um, so yeah, I think the, the opportunities are endless. And I created some soundscapes, which are really dope, audio soundscapes that I think could even be per, um, transformed into some performative sort of measures. I, I have a lot of ideas, we can talk. <laughs> I would connect to that and share a resource for you. There's an organization called Made in Brownsville, and they really are uh, oriented towards spatial justice, but they collaborate and work with young people in Brownsville, Brooklyn, in this work. And one of the big things that they responded to, you can Google it, there was like a New York Times article that highlighted Brownsville, Brooklyn as like kind of the worst place in America to grow up in terms of their outcomes for education and health and equity. So it created a real issue around, well, if you are a young person there, and this is the narrative, this is the story about your childhood, your community, your, they really had to kind of create a variety of counter narratives and using a lot of creative ways in which young people can kind of lead in the design of that and work towards spatial justice. So it's another resource. Uh, so I have a question uh, for Aisha. I, I come from a city, nearby city where the police apprehension vehicle went from Black Mariah to Paddy Wagon to Taco Wagon before it changed its name into the 200 unit to <laughs> sort of address certain issues. So I'm wondering, and I work with the police in this community, and I've worked with youth in Boston and in my community. So I'm wondering, and race always comes up big time. Yeah. Um, so I'm sort of wondering what role that played in your work and your thoughts on that. Yeah, so um, you know, we were underpowered clearly with the sample size of 78 to look at sort of um, different stratified analysis, but I did you know, just try to take some parts out and look at race, look at you know, um, how long, you know, race, culture, um, ethnicity, um, length of, of, of time on the, on the police force, how, how did these factors 
impact what we saw in terms of outcomes. And it actually had no impact. Um, race, um, number of years in the police force, um, did not impact the quantitative outcomes or the qualitative outcomes. I even looked at um, people who gave us a really low rating, um, saying that they didn't enjoy their experience at all in the intervention. And then when you looked at their outcomes, they were actually some of the people who changed the most over time, um, quantitatively. And, and their qualitative excerpts actually indicate high trust and, and, and empathy and sentiment. So um, that's promising, I think, for, for the, the strength of storytelling, the strength of, of, of um, giving people the power to, to, to say and have space and control over their own narrative. There's something very, very, um, very powerful about that. Um, So on that, <clears throat> on that note, I think I want to thank everybody for coming out today. And I, I saw some people taking pictures of the slides. I want to let you know that this is all up, will be up, be up on our website. I encourage you to use it, share it with others. Uh, the power of this is immense, as you know, I think. And people are talking about how do you spread the word. Well, one way is to make sure that people take a look at it. So I, I really want to give a special thanks to both of you. It's such a pleasure to have you here. And I hope you all join me in thanking both of them. Thank you.